joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'll call your attention to our program. I don't want to have to read all that to you, but let's say that the Navy Now Forum is uh, sort of a joint venture project between the Vice Chief of Naval Operations and the Association. Uh, we are doing an annual event in Washington at the Army Navy Club, and this is our first event on the West Coast. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to do about one quarter around the country, and the idea, as your program tells you, is to give the Navy an opportunity to address a varied audience and talk about something that's on the Navy's mind at the time. So, it is, of course, my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for today. Uh, we've each had our bios read a lot, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, it is in the program there for you. Let me just say that he has commanded at all levels. He commanded an F-14 squadron. That was back before they became museum pieces, right, Admiral? Mm. Uh, that happens to all of us, by the way. He's commanded the USS Kitty Hawk and the Enterprise Strike Group. He's coming to us uh, here in San Diego, back to the great place of San Diego for the Navy. I did two tours here myself and uh, often think about this place when I'm in Washington, D.C. But anyway, the Admiral's coming to us from the Pentagon where he was involved in the N-88 shop, which is basically aviation uh, procurement and budgeting issues, so he is well qualified to be our latest Chief of Naval Air Forces and Chief of the Navy uh, Air Force Pacific. So with that comment, Vice Admiral Alan G. Myers. All right, you hear it back okay? Sure. Well, I asked about the, uh, the singer who was uh, kind enough to sing at my change command on the 1st of July. And uh, I was going to recognize her. I was going to call her up and actually uh, give her something. But uh, in true Navy fashion, she's uh, busy at work, uh, having to go back for rehearsal practice, uh, I guess for perhaps your next meeting. Anyway, uh, I, I would like to, if those of you that may know her, if you please pass on to her that uh, we're extending her a round of applause. I thought she was spectacular. <laughs> As you may know, uh, I've been in San Diego four months, okay, and couldn't be happier, couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, Judy and I uh, moved from D.C., and this was my sixth and seventh assignment in Washington and uh, for a total of 11 years there and there was so much momentum for me to come to the West Coast and get out of DC my only concern was that I wouldn't overshoot and wind up in the Pacific so I couldn't tell you how happy I am and and what I was not prepared for, I was anticipating the good weather, I was anticipating a, a great assignment and an opportunity to be uh, close to the flight line and the waterfront. But what I wasn't uh, anticipating, and I had only heard about, but didn't have a chance to experience, was the incredible uh, support and hospitality by the San Diego and Coronado community. And when you think about it, it makes sense uh, why the Navy is here. Obviously, location, location, but, but when you look at the support and the way that the community embraces the Navy and, and, and just the experience that I've had over the last four months, uh, it's overwhelming. And it's not just overwhelming, it's very genuine. And I think that's what's most meaningful to me is the way that you support our sailors and Marines. And I see it at the front tables, and I see it around the community, and I just want to extend my appreciation. Now, whenever I talk to different groups, I'd like to start off with just a little bit about who we are and then take you into the century of naval aviation and why we're going to celebrate and then talk about our Navy today and some of the challenges that I think we're going to face and then open it up to your questions. So, Casey, if that's apples or serious, and if that's okay with you guys, then, uh, then that's the way we'll proceed. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated birthday, our Navy's 235th birthday. Okay, 235 years. So, if I take you back in time, let's see if this goes right. 
by taking you back in time. On October 5th of 1775, the Continental Congress received some intelligence. Now make sure the SEALs are listening to this. <laughs> this is before the SEALs. Anyway, they had intelligence that there was two ships that were being loaded with ammunition and arms in England and get ready to set sail for then North America to rearm the British Army. So this is the 5th of October. On the 13th of October, the Continental Congress met again and they made a resolution, resolved that we need a Continental Navy. So that's the date that we celebrate our birthday. Typically, you celebrate a birthday when you receive something or something's kind of packaged. So we celebrate our birthday on October 13, 1775. And what's significant about that is a couple of things. One is this is about nine months before we declared our independence. So before we're a nation, we're a name. Now, Continental Congress decided we needed a navy and we needed fast. So they didn't have time to build the first couple of ships. They decided to reflag them. So they took an existing ship, the Black Prince, and reflagged it the Alfred. Then, in quick succession, they reflagged a couple other ships and then started building some. So they had enough to set sail in uh, the November, December timeframe to try to intercept these uh, ammunition laden ships bound for North America. So our forefathers did a couple things that are very, very noteworthy. One is they reacted quickly, okay, eight days from intelligence to a resolution, which is pretty impressive. Second is they determined 235 years ago that they needed a navy for two reasons. One is they wanted to influence another country. And second, is they wanted to control the lanes of commerce. So influencing another country and controlling the lanes of commerce are the two reasons that our Navy was built. And 235 years later, that's exactly what we're doing today. We exist for two reasons. To influence coalitions, we can build them, or we can disrupt them. We can control the lanes of commerce. We can keep them open, or we can close them. Only the Navy can assure a nation of economic prosperity and peace by doing those two things. So 235 years of influencing coalitions and controlling the sea lanes of commerce. But to do that, you have to be there. You can't do it virtually. Okay? So to be there means you have to be forwardly present, and to be forwardly present means you're not a garrison force. That's what we're all about. Now, a hundred years ago, something significant happened with our Navy that we like to talk about and we're going to celebrate next year. And that's naval aviation and how naval aviation contributes to our Navy's ability to influence coalitions in other countries and control the lanes of commerce. Back in 1910, there was a young man, Eugene Eli, who sold cars up in Oregon, who decided that he was going to try to help his boss out, and his boss bought a Curtis Pusher and fly it for him. Okay, Eugene Eli said, well, I'm a race car driver, so it's got to be close. You've got to think about this 1910 race car driver. You know, how, how competitive was that? So he decided that because he knew how to drive cars pretty well, that he, it's got to be easy to fly an airplane. So he volunteered to go pick it up. And he, on his first flight, he crashed it. Okay, that's moral of the story number one. Aviation could be a very hazardous and unforgiving business. Well, he felt bad, he bought it from his boss, rebuilt it, and then taught himself how to fly, and then wound up doing some aerial demonstrations. He caught the eye of a couple of folks, uh, Curtis, Glenn Curtis, and um, Washington Irving Chambers, 
who was a Navy SWO captain assigned to the Bureau of Ordnance, who was the, uh, designated by then Secretary of the Navy Meyer, uh, no relation, um, to go and, and scope out these aerial planes and see what, what good they were. And uh, Captain Washington Irving Chambers thought that maybe these airplanes could serve as scout vehicles or something. Because remember, our Navy at the time could influence an area that they could see from the crow's nest. Okay, that's that's about as far as they could they could see and as far as they could influence. So Eugene Eli uh, teams up and they build a uh, sort of flight deck uh, on the Birmingham and then in the fall of 1910 they do the first launch out of Hampton Roads. And then a few months later the same guy in San Francisco Bay takes his airplane and uh, lands on the USS Pennsylvania on a makeshift flight deck. Now, that wasn't an easy feat, the first landing on a, uh, a ship. This was a uh, heavy cruiser. They, at the Bear Island shipyard, they built about a 130 foot long uh, wooden deck back behind the turrets and about 30 feet wide. Well, shortly before he launched in January of 1911, um, he figured out that he needed about 180 feet the length, okay, and uh, uh, so his math said he was a little bit short, so he came up with a way to tie some rope in between some sandbags and put them in, in succession and figured that his landing gear would catch these ropes and slow him down. So he launches off, it's 11 o'clock, it's cold, it's January, and he flies around for about an hour and he makes about three passes before he gets he's comfortable enough to actually attempt a landing okay and that's lesson number two is your first pass isn't always your your best one so he lands and as fate would have it his tires roll across the rope that's tied to the sandbags that's meant to slow him down but he catches the last rope and when our vernacular of four wire, and uh, he slows down just a few feet in front of a canvas barrier that's uh, next to one of the turrets, and comes to a successful stop. So he's cold, they take him downstairs, give him a cup of coffee, and ask him, how was it? You know, what's your opinion? And he said, it was easy. <laughs> he said, uh, I could do it every day. So the third moral of the story is even with the first arrested landing, a pilot associated easy with daytime. <laughs> the Navy was smart, and a week later, Theodore Ellison is flying with Glenn Curtis out of the flying school down here, right here, out of North Island. Okay. So one week later, after this event, we have our first Navy lady flies here at North Island. Things take off pretty quickly. The Navy sees the need for this kind of, of uh, warfighting capability, and on May 8th of 1911, Washington Irving Chambers, back in the Bureau of Ordnance, requisitions the first airplanes. So that becomes our Naval Aviation Birthday, because that's when we wrote the check to get our first aircraft. Things take off pretty quickly after that. 1911, okay, this is, remember that they have the Spreckles, or the Spreckles uh, Resort, which later became, becomes Hotel Dell, uh, but there's not much here on the North Island part, so kind of a hog farm, but it's location, location, because it's got, the weather is great, it's nice and flat, and it's also great access to the bay and the ocean, so things take off pretty quickly and we build a camp here, uh, right here on North Island uh, called Camp Trouble. Uh, 1917, the Navy, or actually the Department of Defense, uh, back then says, well, we need to make this a formal operation and a uh, portion land to the, uh, both the Army 